Hello, I am Eleanor Fox from New York University School of Law. I am here with Frederic Genet from ASEC Business School in Paris and chair of the Competition Law Committee of OECD. And we are presenting our number three podcast sponsored by Concurrence called Antitrust Code. So Frederick, welcome. We are going to have a conversation now on acquisitions and mergers. We're going to talk about both um, the problem that has come up recently of should the merger law address acquisitions of startups, <clears throat> killer acquisitions, for example. And we may even want to talk about other merger in issues that concern us today, such as efficiencies and how to deal with efficiencies in the merger law. So thank you for being here. And I'd like to hear your answer, first of all, devoted to, is there a problem of very large firms gobbling up startups that might be said to become anti-competitive if they were let to live on their own rather than be acquired by that firm? Is that a problem? How should we think about it? How should we deal with it? Thank you very much, Eleanor, for raising this uh, really important and quite difficult uh, question. Uh, just a, a first uh, very short remark. Uh, when you ask whether we should do something about killer acquisitions, uh, it seems to me that the answer is obvious. The answer is yes. The difficulty is how do, do we recognize a killer acquisition? Uh, how do we recognize the fact that were it not for the merger, the startup would have developed and become successful? Uh, and if it had to become successful, why is it that the owners decided to sell it to someone else rather than become successful on the market? Now, merger control requires two predictions. First, a prediction as to the likely effect of the merger on competition. But second, a prediction of how competition on the market would have developed uh, if there had been no merger. Um, now, this is where there is a difficulty for competition authorities, I think. In general, predicting the future is all the more complex that the time frame of the predictive exercise is long, and that the sector that we talk about evolves rapidly or has a lot of innovation content. And it is not by chance that uh, there are two sectors where the kind of issues that you are raising uh, became quite prominent, which are the pharmaceutical sector and the digital sector, because those are two sectors where we do have a uh, lot of innovation by small firms and where there is a real concern um, uh, about the development of uh, technology and uh, about whether merger control is doing a good job. Now, as I said, predicting the future is all the more conflict, complex that the time frame of the uh, exercise is long. Uh, uh, and I think that competition authorities have recognized that. And to try to deal with this, they have tended to undertake the analysis of mergers within a very short time frame. Lots of competition authorities will say, oh, I'm only looking to the three to five years maximum after the merger because it's too complicated to go further uh, in time. Now, this to me is like looking for your key where there is light rather than where you lost it. Uh, it's easier to look where there is light, but it may not be where you lost it. Um, now, um, competition authorities therefore have focused on the immediate anti-competitive effect of merger, and they have tended to discount 
the possible efficiency gains of mergers because such efficiencies typically happen in a more distant future because it takes time to reorganize production or it takes time to have successful, uh, to combine successful research, uh, uh, et cetera. And therefore, those efficiency gains have been considered to be too speculative by competition authority to take into consideration. Now, interestingly, uh, when the EU reviewed the Dupont, Dow, the Dow Dupont merger, the EU Commission couldn't find any immediate overlap in the short term. So it should normally have concluded that there was no competition issue because it looks at the short term and there was no overlap. But it departed from its traditional short term focus and looked at the long term and whether in the long term there were possible anti-competitive effect of the merger on the innovation pipeline. Okay, so we're talking about innovation. We don't even know what products could be uh, uh, invented, but we're saying, well, if those two pipelines get together, maybe some products will not be uh, uh, found uh, because it won't be in the interest of the merged firms to do that. Now, why do I say that this is interesting? To me, it's interesting for two reasons. First of all, because there is a little bit of schizophrenia, at least in the EU Commission, in the sense that it's perfectly willing to look at the long term uh, to try to find anti-competitive effects, but it's not so willing to look at the long term to assess efficiency benefits or innovation benefits. And I think that there is uh, there uh, uh, something which is not quite uh, justified. The second thing is that the Dow Dupont merger tells us that irrespective of what competition authorities have been saying, that they only look at the short term. When they want to look at the long term, they do so. And this is exactly what the EC Commission did in the Dow Dupont merger uh, um, on the sides of whether there would be anti competitive effects. So, okay, so uh, it's unfortunate that there are very few cases, uh, or maybe there are none, where the EC Commission or where uh, competition authorities have taken a long-term view on possible efficiency benefits related to mergers uh, or possibly long-term view on uh, changing competition, uh, changing conditions of competition on markets. So the merger control kind of analysis has come under a lot of criticism uh, even before the emergence of the digital sector. In Europe, what was criticized was the focus on short-term price effects and the lack of consideration of how the big picture of competition could evolve over time. And this was the criticism, and I'm not saying that it was correct to criticize the decision, but this was certainly the criticism which was leveled against the Alstom Siemens merger by saying you're taking a very narrow provincial approach uh, and short-term approach without realizing that the Chinese are coming and uh, that the conditions of competition are going to change very soon and that we need to be prepared for that. So. Now, another criticism, particularly in the digital sector, was the apparent inability of competition authority to come up with uh, credible counterfactuals. Uh, and we get back to one of the reasons which I mentioned in a different postcast, um, this is very difficult. Uh, there's a very difficult question to answer, which is, would the small startup targeted by the acquiring firms, the acquiring big tech firm, would that small firm have developed, would it have developed into a serious competitor or would it have failed and disappeared because it would never have gotten the network effects that it needed or for whatever reason? Um, uh, there's an extremely good example of this, which is the OFT uh, Facebook Instagram merger, where uh, the OFT failed to see that Instagram could develop into a social network, which could compete with Facebook, uh, or that Facebook uh, uh, would get a dominant position if it acquired uh, Instagram. Uh, now, there, there's a failure to establish uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, default hypothesis. I mean, what would have happened without the uh, the merger? 
arm. Now, the difficulty in coming up with reliable counterfactual is largely due to the fact that we don't have a robust economic theory on the relationship between competition and innovation. And we have an incomplete, even though we are, uh, uh, this incompleteness is being uh, solved slowly but surely, but still an incomplete understanding of competition between ecosystems. So what we need to do a better job in terms of merger control are three, four things. A better understanding of the relationship between innovation and competition, and there we need the help of economists because we don't understand it very well. A better understanding of potential competition in the digital sector, uh, because potential competition, the, comp the potential competition legal doctrine of the US, for example, is not applicable in the digital sector. There is a different uh, uh, circumstances and uh, potential competition is much more, uh, much uh, more uh, can come from different markets in the digital world uh, much more easily than in the non-digital world. We need a longer and more consistent time perspective. And finally, we need to accept if, at least if we have a total surplus uh, uh, standpoint, uh, uh, or uh, uh, standard, uh, to, we need to have a more balanced consideration of efficiencies and anti-competitive effects. So I think that if we could move on those four fronts, there would be much more acceptance of merger control than there is now. So thank you very much. Um, that's, that's a very rich responses. I would like to um, start my comments by focusing on the startup, um, because we also have some separate issues on efficiencies, and then I want to come back on some separate issues on efficiencies and ask you how you might relate your ideas to some big firm mergers. I want to suggest at the outset that for some people, the, there is a precautionary principle. And for some statutes, there is a precautionary principle. Um, for example, when the US Clayton Act was uh, passed, it's, it was precautionary. It said we prohibit anti-competitive mergers where their effect may be anti-competitive. Um, I, the precautionary principle in mergers fits together with a very commonly felt um, notion of excessive power happening in our society. You may not agree that this should be happening. I see it as happening and not just in the US, the concern of too much corporate power. And perhaps together with a lot of research that has shown that very large, big mergers, especially those that take a competitor off the market, usually fail. And so therefore, not, not too much concern with prohibiting something that's going to be really good for the people. Maybe it's too little in your view, but this is what I think that that we do have, at least in certain societies in the application of our law, not too much concern that we are losing a lot by prohibiting big mergers. Bringing it back to two, because that could be big mergers of two competitors, but bringing it back to startups, I wanted to say a word and ask you something very specific. You've noted the problem, of course, you have, if we unwind back to 2012 or 2014, we have Facebook um, looking at the acquisition of Instagram and WhatsApp. And how is one to predict, you said this, how is an agency to predict at that moment in time, whether Facebook's acquiring that merger will increase Facebook's power and same, the other side of the coin, but somewhat separate, 
take off the market a firm that would have been a really good challenger. And there are many people who say on the more conservative side is no way to make that judgment with any degree of certainty. And there are problems of simply prohibiting startup acquisitions because, as you say, they may actually lead to delivering better goods and services. So this is my proposition to you. In the Facebook case, Facebook had actually made an acquisition and designed a program to snap up all startups that it identified as potential threats to it. And it made scores of those acquisitions. And the document seemed to show that it was making those acquisitions in order to build a moat around itself and to prevent the trees from bloom, the flowers from blooming or the trees from growing. Um, do you think it would be wise thinking about another situation that replicates those facts in the future. Um, do you think it would be wise to have a policy at least where the company itself that has market power is snapping up firms in order to prevent them from growing because it considers them a threat? Well, um... Let me answer by, uh, by a joke in, in some way. It takes two to tangle. So it takes the owners of the startup a decision to sell when they could, assuming uh, that uh, your hypothesis is why, they, they could develop into a wonderful competitor of uh, Facebook. Uh, so why do you think they decide to sell? Are they irrational? They don't see that they could grow? and they don't see that they could acquire much more money by uh, uh, becoming uh, big and successful themselves. Um, so there's something that is not entirely clear in my mind, which is whether those firms get snapped up because there is a malicious intent on the part of Facebook and a defeatism on the part of their owners or whether it is because the owners of the startups, having developed a, something that could develop into an innovation, don't have either the money or the ability to actually push it uh, on the market to the extent where it would become a, a competitor to Facebook. I think we do have to separate those two cases. Now, if it is uh, uh, clear that those from would have liked to stay alive and would have liked not to sell to Facebook, but were forced by Facebook using uh, unfair tactics to sell to Facebook, I would have no qualms about saying, well, that is the kind of merger that I want to prohibit because uh, the only reason why there is this merger is because of a lack of, of because of desire to suppress competition. But it seems to me that all the snapping ups of all the uh, startups don't necessarily uh, reflect that kind of situation. Thank you. I want to now pick up your other thread on efficiencies and innovation and go to a situation, a real situation that's going to be T-Mobile buying Sprint in the United States. And ask you how you fit in your theories and perceptions on both efficiencies and innovation um, to this problem. So here is the way I'll state the problem. In the United States, we had four big telecom companies, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. Um, T-Mobile wants to buy Sprint. Both T-Mobile and Sprint have some uh, innovative characteristics because they're both in the underdog uh, category. 
our Justice Department actually brokered a deal and said, yes, this should go through. And the deal was to spin off some assets to DISH, which was small, not really in the market yet, and hoped to take the place of the lost competition because it was clear there was lost competition. However, not everybody agreed that this was going to be pro-competitive. And actually states of the United States brought an action in federal court to say this should be enjoined. It's a merger from four to three. We have no uh, way to uh, suppose that DISH is really going to survive and take up the slack. And it will lead us with a more highly concentrated market and higher prices and less innovation. So it goes to trial. There are economists on both sides. They're both very convincing. The Judge Marrero says, yeah, each one was very convincing. Each one, when I listened to that person alone, I was convinced. But then I heard the other one. They cancel each other out. I'm just going to have to go by credibility. I think the story that Dish would take the, up the slack of the lost innovation was credible. Therefore, the merger is fine. These are huge problems underlying that tip of the iceberg. How would you deal with the problem if you were either a judge being one of the, the only French judge who is on the Supreme Court of Paris in of France? Um, so you're both economist, judge, and academic. How would you deal with the problem? Uh, well, first of all, this is an, an excellent illustration of what I was saying earlier uh, as to the fact that, uh, unfortunately, the economists have not given us a very good scenario of relationship between competition and innovation. And that's why your judge, in this case, ended up saying, well, I'm convinced by both economists uh, or by neither one of them, but uh, uh, by both, because... Uh, we don't have a unitary kind of approach of the relationship between competition and innovation. So it does mean, in fact, that in this field, uh, economies tend to cancel each other out because you can say many things, nobody knows, you know, they, there's no general theory. And so therefore it comes down to empirical estimates and, and which are, which can be, or seem to be convincing, even if they are not uh, uh, the whole uh, story. So then the question for the judge is, OK, because the economies can sell themselves out, uh, what should I base uh, myself on? And that I come back to your idea of precautionary principle. And the precautionary principle can have two different applications. One of them, uh, as a precaution, I want to prevent the merger. Uh, because I don't want to reduce the number of players on the market, and I recognize that there could be a loss of competition by allowing the merger. But the precautionary principle could equally apply to innovation by saying, well, uh, I have uh, two innovative firms and they want to work to, uh, together. Um, maybe I should allow the merger, even if it's going to reduce competition, at least in the short run, because maybe these stronger innovators who have only been second tier so far uh, could develop more innovation uh, in the market. So I'm not sure that the precautionary principle really helped us in this case. Thank you. In the aftermath, DISH did not become, I mean, it's tried, it hasn't become a strong competitor. And I've seen in the press that AT&T might buy up DISH and that prices have gone up. Um, and I want to comment on the timeline for our learning enough on innovation. I wonder, maybe because time is really short and it might be just rhetoric, if you really think in 10 years from now, we'll know the answer to that, to those really important questions that you've posed and you've laid out a research agenda, will we really know those answers as to what promotes innovation more? You look like you do want to answer that question. Uh, I, I think that uh, we will have uh, a better sense indeed. Uh, there was quite a bit of research in the 70s and 80s 
on the relationship between competition and innovation. Uh, and then after that, there was not much and, and it has started again. And Aguillon, for example, in the new generation as an economist has been working on, on, on those issues. So I do think that slowly but surely, uh, we, we, A, we have learned a few things. We have learned to distinguish between the influence of competition before the innovation and competition after the innovation. And we know that uh, uh, if there is competition after the innovation, in other words, if the intellectual property rights are not very strong, uh, then there's gonna be less innovation uh, than uh, if we uh, had better intellectual property rights. We also know that too much concentration before the innovation kills the incentive to innovate. Okay, so we are slowly but surely accumulating little bricks uh, that will uh, hopefully help us. Now, whether in 10 years from now, we'll know much more. Uh, I certainly hope so. I can see that there are people looking for this. And I would say the same thing, by the way, about the uh, understanding competition uh, in the digital economy. Uh, lots of competition authorities, lots of economists, and lots of combination of economies and competition authorities have been working on this to try to deepen their understanding of the mechanism uh, to try, for example, I mean, I mean, just to give you an example, you said earlier uh, that network effects were very important in the digital economy, and, uh, and that's absolutely true. And yet, if you look at TikTok, or if you look at Spotify, those are two very successful firms, which have not benefited from original network effects, but have created them. Uh, so it seems that network effect, and they have displaced, I mean, certainly in the case of Spotify, it has displaced existing uh, uh, sites uh, that uh, were uh, offering the same music service um, and were much, much larger. So network effects work in some cases as a barrier to entry, and in other cases, they seem to be, I mean, startups seem to be able to overcome those. We have to get a better understanding on when it is a barrier to entry, which is impassable, when it can be overcome. And this is what uh, a lot of, of the uh, research and a lot both by competition authorities and by economists is uh, trying to ascertain these days. So I think that light is coming. Thank you. So you have given a great research agenda for those economists and especially perhaps some young academic economists who are looking for what is needed to solve vital problems in the world on competition. Thank you very much, Frederick. That was very enlightening and helpful. A pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Eleanor.